everyone. Welcome. My name is Kara McDonald. I'm the Director for Philanthropy and Plan Giving at the Seattle Public Library Foundation. And on behalf of our partner in this webinar series, the King County Library System Foundation, we want to say welcome to all of you this afternoon. We're so glad you're here for our final estate planning webinar of this year. I have a few very quick things for you before our presentation begins. First, we are recording this presentation and you will receive a link to the recording and slides after we wrap up. We'll send that in the next couple of days. To ask a question of our speakers at any point, please use the Q&A button, not the chat, to make sure that our speakers can see it. And if you see a question that you'd especially like answered, use the little thumbs up button next to it so you can upvote it. Tiffany and Liberty will be sorting the questions by your upvotes, so the ones with the most votes are the ones that they'll see first. And finally, when you sign off today, you'll be prompted to take a very short survey about your experience. Please take a few minutes to, to complete this for us. Uh, your feedback really does make a huge difference. In fact, the topic of today's webinar um, was inspired by repeated requests in those surveys. So we really do listen to your feedback. Um, and everyone who completes this survey will be entered in a drawing to win a wonderful raffle prize, which is a bag filled with books. Um, I'm now going to invite our speakers, Tiffany Gordon and Liberty Upton, to join me on screen. Tiffany and Liberty are both attorneys at KHBB Law here in Seattle, and Tiffany has been curating this webinar series for us all year long, and we're so grateful for her time and expertise, as well as that of her colleague, Liberty, who's joining her today. Thank you both so much for being here, and please take it away. Thanks so much, Kara. Um, and I just want to reiterate um, the importance uh, to both Liberty and I, and frankly, I think speakers in general, um, for folks filling out those surveys. They are super helpful. Um, well, one, you get registered to win a free bag of books, so why wouldn't you fill it out? Um, but they're also really helpful um, as a speaker. And we've had um, actually two, I think, presentations throughout this series this year um, one that Liberty and I did uh, earlier in the winter that was tax related, where we actually had such an overwhelming number of questions that we put together um, kind of a pre recorded response to um, answer all of those questions as kind of a part two um, of that conversation, which is available online. And as Kara said, this particular presentation um, was born out of just the number of um, questions and comments and input that we received um, from folks like you who had attended other webinars um, that myself and that Liberty um, had participated in. So it's really helpful to hear kind of from the audience in terms of what what information is useful, what you're looking for, things like that. So um, we super appreciate that and and keep that coming. Um, so in um, in terms of kind of what we're going to chat about today, as I said, um, this was sort of born from folks um, input uh, over the course of the last year. And the title is Who Should Fill Your Shoes? Considerations for Choosing Fiduciaries. And um, folks have asked kind of a lot of questions along the way about, well, who should I appoint as my agent for finances or agent for healthcare? or executor or trustee. Um, and we'll talk all about those roles um, throughout our presentation. But that was um, kind of a repeat question that we continue to get in a conversation that both Liberty and I have very frequently um, with almost every client um, in kind of in depth as to kind of what folks make sense in those roles. Um, additionally, talking about kind of some of the foundational planning um, from a individual's perspective that may be married, uh, may be single, um, all different um, kind of types of status, so to speak, is um, another kind of question or request that we've received throughout this year. And so we're going to focus a lot on just kind of varying aspects of those documents, those foundational documents, um, and different types of individuals and how um, those documents fit into our own individual tailored lives. And so with that, I'm going to share my screen. And kind of, I mentioned some of these already, um, what estate planning documents should every person have? And these are really kind of the foundational pieces, the cornerstones, if you will, um, for every individual plan from my perspective. 
And this really, um, these documents cover folks from maybe you have a Buick and a base fiddle, but you want to make sure that you are selecting your executor and appointing the person that you would want to serve um, to administer your estate or your trust um, or to serve in various roles related to your durable power of attorney all the way up to, oh, I have a significant estate or I have amassed some some pretty significant wealth and I may have some tax planning that needs to be done. So these four documents here that we're going to talk about today, um, at, at least at the outset of our um, presentation, kind of are an uh, all shapes and sizes type documents. They are tailored to every individual um, that kind of comes through our doors, that every client that we work with. Um, and you can you can tailor them um, to to your own specific needs. Um, and again, regardless of kind of shape or size of your estate, these are kind of the foundational pieces. There are a lot of tools um, that we work with that come into play for various tax planning reasons, which we've included some slides at the end of this presentation. Um, we It's unlikely that we're going to get all the way through and to those, those kind of more um, specialized tax tools, but we have included those slides because I know that that can be really good food for thought for folks as they're reviewing the slides after a presentation. And so just to kind of let you know, there are some of those at the end of this um, that we may get to, um, we may not, but you can certainly review those on your own as you're going through um, the slides, which Kara is going to share with everybody. Um, so in, in any event, as we're talking through today, we're going to be hitting the durable power of attorney, um, utilizing regular um, kind of simple wills or revocable living trusts, healthcare directives, and a directive regarding disposition of remains. Um, and note the asterisks here, um, Liberty and I do these two a little bit differently. It's just a stylistic preference. Um, but sometimes the healthcare directive is included in a durable power of attorney, and sometimes it's not. It's more the language, less of is there one separate document or not. And so with that, um, Liberty's gonna chat a little bit about um, each of these kind of who, she, who should be named as a fiduciary and kind of move into some of these documents. Okay, so thank you, Tiffany. Um, I'm Liberty. I work with Tiffany at KHBB Law. Um, and like Tiffany mentioned, kind of the first part of this is really we got a lot of feedback on, you know, who do you select in some of these roles? So we're going to start with kind of the, the base point of when you're appointing somebody to act on your behalf, that person is considered a fiduciary. So this could be a person, it could be a company, an organization, and they're acting on your behalf or on the behalf of some other beneficiary in your estate plan. So where we're going to see this, we're going to broadly refer to these people as fiduciaries, but they could be serving in one of many roles. So that could be either the personal representative or the executor. It's the same thing, just referred to a little bit differently. That's going to be the person who's administering your estate under your will. This could be a trustee of a trust. This could be your agent or attorney. In fact, again, another name for the exact same role under a durable power of attorney. And when it comes to people or organizations that can serve in this role, it's really pretty broad of who you can actually appoint. And for some people, this might be a family member, either a parent or a child or a sibling. Some people don't have a ton of family or they're not close with their family. And so it might make more sense to kind of go with that chosen family of picking a friend. Then there's other people who are like, you know what, this is actually a job and it's kind of a burden to put on somebody to actually be serving in this role. This is not an easy thing. Yes, they can be paid, but it actually is kind of complicated. And so maybe they want to appoint somebody who does this professionally. So it might be a professional fiduciary, an attorney, a CPA, or even bigger, the banks or trust companies. Next slide, Tiffany. So when it comes to figuring out, do you have someone in your life that can serve in this role? You kind of want to go through a self gut check of, you know, thinking of the people in your life and kind of what their strengths and weaknesses are and kind of what role they play in their in your life and 
how responsible you think they are. So you want to make sure that this is going to be someone who communicates clearly with you and your family. Some of this might be, you know, if you're alive but incapacitated of who's stepping in to make sure your bills are being paid or who's making healthcare decisions. So we want them to be able to effectively communicate with you and the other people who may or may not be involved in your life. So other family members, are they going to be able to kind of talk to everyone in those roles? We want to make sure that this person's going to be responsible, both financially of can they manage finances, and two, are they responsive to phone calls? I have certain family members that will not pick up the phone if an unknown number calls them. Maybe they're not the best person to be serving in a healthcare power of attorney role where doctors are trying to get a hold of them, right? So it's kind of the who's who's responsible in your world. Um, where they're located might make a difference in whether or not you select them of sometimes it's really nice to have somebody who's local. And then other times it might make sense that the person who's going to make the best decision for you doesn't live near you. But for certain things like appointing a trustee of a trust, Appointing somebody in a place like Oregon or California with an income tax could unnecessarily subject a Washington trust to tax in those areas. So, you know, it's one of those things where that's something to really work through an, an attorney of when you're considering who's in your world, where they're located might make an impact on whether or not you should appoint them in that role. Um, and of course, we want this person to be able to act in your best interest and make sure, you know, that if they maybe don't know how to manage things or how to invest things, that we at least trust them to hire the right help of hiring a, you know, an attorney to help them, hiring a CPA, working with a financial advisor. If we know that they can surround themselves with the right help, they might be the right person for that job, even if they don't have the particular skills. Um, somebody's going to have to be 18 to serve in any of these roles, but generally speaking, we don't really want to appoint an 18 year old in that role that they might not be the best person for that role. We're usually looking at over 25 for some of these big responsibilities for people. Um, we want to make sure that they can be assertive and handle pressure. They might be making potentially life and death healthcare decisions for you on your behalf. So that's a that's a pretty heavy burden to put on someone. So we want to make sure that they can handle that pressure. And also we want to make sure that they're willing and able to act. Um, you know, this might be something where you decide your sibling's the best person for this role, but they've just had a new baby. You know, maybe they've got something in their lives where temporarily they might not be the right person or something along those lines. So really just kind of assessing who's in your world and what they have going on to determine if they're the right fit. Next slide, Tiffany. So when you're kind of assessing who's in your world to make these decisions for you, you're looking at family and friends. That's going to be the first step there. Those people are going to be entitled to hourly compensation. This is a job, but they're not going to be getting rich off of this, right? They're going to be charging, you know, $25 to $50 an hour to be doing any sort of the, the work that will be required as a fiduciary. If you don't have somebody in your world that you, uh, can, that can serve in that role or that you want to serve in that role, then we look at kind of the other professionals that do this of an independent fidesh, professional fiduciary, an attorney or CPA, and then we get to bigger banks and trust companies and kind of as we go down that list, prices start to increase as to who's serving in that role with banks and trust companies generally being the kind of highest paid in that role. And now back to you, Tiffany. Okay, thanks, Liberty. So from there, we're going to chat about kind of some of these documents. So again, these are the foundational pieces that are really um important for any plan as kind of a starting point. And the first one is the durable power of attorney. And I like to talk about this one first. Um, my clients hear this. If you've listened to any of the prior presentations, you've heard me say this. I think that this is the most important piece of any plan. It's very important what happens to your assets post-death. And so, you know, that comes in under the will. Um, that's something that is very important. But this document takes effect um, for during life. 
And that's why I say that this is the most important piece. Um, as I mentioned, um, sometimes the power of attorney has both the healthcare piece and the financial piece. Sometimes they're two separate documents. I draft mine so that the durable power of attorney contains um, those healthcare pieces. But importantly, what this document does in and of itself is it puts somebody on deck, so to speak. So for finances, it makes sure that you're appointing, you know, your spouse or your child or your niece or your nephew or your family, family member, your friend, your neighbor, whoever is in your world, the people that are in your life that you would say, I would want this person to step in and assist with my finances in the event that I was incapacitated either for a season or for a longer term. I think a lot of times folks think about durable powers of attorney and healthcare um, powers of attorney or healthcare directives relating to kind of end of life situations. But I want to point out that for, with the with regard to these positions as agent for finances, and it's true for agent for healthcare as well, that those can be a little bit of a longer term position. And what that person is doing is stepping in at the nomination and appointment of the principal. So in my durable power of attorney, I'm the principal, I nominate an agent. And in the event that I become incapacitated and can no longer you know, manage my own finances, um, make sure that my mortgage is paid, make sure that my taxes are filed on time. All the things that I do in my own financial life now, in the event that something were to come up for either a season of life or for a longer term period, having somebody appointed as my agent that can step in and take care of those things, make sure that the wheels stay on, so to speak, um, throughout my, you know, whatever's going on with my capacity issues, um, that is kind of what this document does. They can be um, effective immediately, or they can be effective upon incapacity. Um, oftentimes for um, a lot of folks will say, you know what, having this effective uh, immediately makes good sense for me. Either they're appointing their spouse or they otherwise simply don't want to have um, have to have their agent go through the trouble of getting um, something from a healthcare provider or otherwise indicating that the that they're no longer that they no longer have capacity. So oftentimes folks will elect to make that um, effective immediately. And basically what that does is it does allow the person that you've appointed to step in and manage your, your financial life, your financial world in the same way that you can. So this is a huge position of trust. They can step in and do virtually almost anything with your assets and your financial life that you can do when they're serving as your agent. And so making sure that it's somebody who is very trustworthy, you know, Liberty went through a number of things to think about in terms of how you would, would select someone um, and who you would appoint in that role. But just knowing that that's a huge responsibility. And so that is oftentimes, and I feel like we're seeing this more and more frequently with folks that say, you know what, this is a really big job. Folks, you know, historically have felt a little bit um, uncomfortable appointing somebody professionally to serve in that role, I think, and feel like, oh, I have to name my oldest child or I have to name a family member. If you have an oldest child or family member that is in your life that in that person makes sense in terms of kind of they fit the, the job description, then that's fantastic. But if you don't, or if you just say, you know what, this is a big job and I want to make sure that I'm not either overburdening this individual or simply I want to make sure that I have a professional in place to do this. More and more, we're seeing folks um, kind of turn to these local professional fiduciaries. And as Liberty talked about, there are varying um, kind of types of, of folks that serve in these roles as professionals. And in our area in particular, in the Puget Sound area, we're very lucky because we have a lot of smaller shops. We have some solos, some small shops where folks are willing to serve as agent for finances trustee, executor, as we'll talk more about, um, that aren't necessarily, we're not limited just to kind of the larger bank circumstances. So before what, you go on, there's one question here that relates to the slide you were just on. Um, oh, sure. 
how difficult is it ha to have somebody declared incapacitated? So if it was effective upon incapacity, kind of how difficult is it to actually like get that person declared incapacitated and then be able to take over versus just starting with the documents effective immediately? That's a great question. Um, that is something that doesn't come up very often for me because most of my clients have their documents drafted as though this is going to be effective immediately. Um, but it is not, um, you can, you can certainly get, um, a note from a physician saying, you know, and typically what you do is, is would take the individual. So, you know, if this were me talking, my agent would say, okay, something's going on with Tiffany. I'm going to take her to her primary care provider, um, and have a conversation about what's going on with her mental capacity and have that physician, you know, kind of write, basically write a letter on their letterhead that says, you know, Tiffany is no longer in the position to make financial decisions um, or something along those lines. And then when you use the durable power of attorney at the bank or with the CPA, because it's tax season, et cetera, you can, if they ask for it, you can certainly show them, you know, this, this has been quote unquote activated, so to speak by, you know, her physician. Um, the more difficult one um, is getting the court of competent jurisdiction to to basically indicate or rule that somebody is incapacitated, and that's something that we see we see come up a lot more in kind of a guardianship space, which um, is you petition the court, you know, to hearing, um, you go before the court commissioner or judge, depending on you know the county that you're in with your facts and circumstances. And that can be a little bit more um, painful for the the, the principal, um, just in terms of, you know, feeling like if they're, if you're going to court to get this done, there's probably a reason why. And sometimes folks don't necessarily recognize that lack of capacity. And so going um, through kind of with their physician is, is probably the easiest, most direct um, causes the least embarrassment or sensitivity um, for that person. Okay. And so what's required is it, the document needs to be signed and dated and either acknowledged before a notary or signed by two or more competent witnesses in the principal's president, presence. So with me as principal, I am signing my durable power of attorney I'm dating it. I'm either doing that before a notary or before two disinterested witnesses. So I call up my neighbors. I say, hey, I'm going to sign my, my power of attorney. I want you to witness it for me. I'm signing at my kitchen table. They're standing in my kitchen. And then they sign off as competent witnesses, which means that they're over 18 and they would be able to testify in court if the circumstances arose where you know there were any type of questions. That is what a competent witness is. And with that, oh, moving forward to healthcare directives. So, so go ahead. So a healthcare directive, as Tiffany mentioned at the beginning, could very well be contained within a durable power of attorney, or it could be a separate document. What's important here is that it's discussed in some manner with your attorney and make some decisions based on kind of um, healthcare decisions you can make in advance. And this is one of those things where when I meet with clients, um, I really do encourage some sort of decision at this point, because it's kind of one of the most loving things you can do for the people who are going to then be in your healthcare power of attorney role to be able to look at this document and execute based on what decisions you've made in advance. So this is going to apply only in two limited circumstances. The first is a terminal illness, and the second is permanent unconscious condition. And I think most people generally have some idea of kind of the permanent unconscious condition of doctors have declared you brain dead, you're not waking up for a from a coma. Terminal illness, I find that clients have a little bit harder time kind of grasping that concept of this is kind of terminal illness 
and you can't communicate. So, you know, something like stage four cancer or ALS, something along those lines where eventually you progress to a point where you can no longer communicate your wishes. If you can talk, if you can write, if you can, you know, respond to cues in some way, people are going to engage with you. But at some point, there may be a time where they can no longer engage with you. And that's where this directive comes into play. So in these limited circumstances of terminal illness or permanent unconscious condition, you can state in advance that you want to keep all life support going. All, you know, artificial breathing, nutrition, hydration, all of those things, keep those going indefinitely. You could decide that you want to remove all life support lever, uh, measures in that situation. And sometimes I have people who make different decisions about artificial nutrition and hydration of they want to remove breathing tubes, but keep nutrition and hydration or, you know, their family's all out of town and they want to give a week before they kind of remove any sort of life support in this situation. But this is the document that your um, power of attorney for healthcare decisions is going to be looking to. So they're going to look at this and see, you know, the principal, you are in a permanent unconscious condition. In this case, you've indicated you don't want life support measures continued. So they're executing your wishes and telling the doctors to remove life support. So this is a really important document. And, you know, at the beginning, Tiffany talked about, we're going to talk about all levels of wealth here. This doesn't matter, you know, for your wealth or anything along those lines. Everyone has an opinion about what they would want to have happen in this situation. So this is one of those core documents that Every person who's over the age of 18 has an opinion on and should be including in their uh, estate plan. Next slide. So this document, in order to be valid, if it is if it's part of your um, healthcare power of attorney, the requirements will be just a slightly bit different. But basically, it's going to be signed by you, dated by you. Um, attested by witnesses in your presence. And the kind of complicating factor here is this isn't something that can be signed, you know, and witnessed by your physician or anyone at a hospital or nursing home or things along those lines. And it can't be anyone who's related to you. So it really does need to be kind of independent of, you know, your family and any sort of healthcare providers when you're executing this document. Next slide. Um, the next document that we would love to have people at least think through is a disposition of remains. Again, sometimes this is contained within the power of attorney, but what we're really looking at here is upon death, what would you like to have happen to your remains? So there's a lot of different options here, and Washington kind of pioneered some of these things, but you know, we're going to start from a base point of if you have a heart on your driver's license, you've already signed up to be part of the organ donor registry. So you may have agreed to donate organ, eyes, tissues for transplant research. And there, there is an actual registry where you can go on and actually see kind of what you've signed up for and either limit or agree to kind of all of it. Um, from there, some people want to donate their body to science. So, you know, University of Washington's in the area. They have a willed body program. They will, um, you know, accept bodies. And then upon, you know, finishing whatever sort of research they're doing with that, they will um, cremate someone and then return the remains to someone. And then beyond there, we have kind of four you know, four categories of uh, how to dispose of remains. So the first is going to be traditional burial. The second is going to be cremation. We have traditional fire cremation, and we also have liquid cremation or aquamation, which is something that a lot of people haven't heard about, but was designed to be more of a green alternative to fire and putting everything up into the air. Um, and the, the last kind of one that we have, which is newer, is composting. And that was something that started in Washington with a study with WSU. And it is a really big thing for a lot of our clients that are really interested in that. So if you haven't been exposed to that, I do recommend kind of looking into that. Um, but these kind of things are, again, somebody is going to be executing your wishes at this point. So I have a lot of clients that are like, I don't care. I've died. Somebody else can handle this kind of a situation. Well, 
those people are going to be grieving the loss of you. So it's helpful to at least give them some direction of, I'd like to be cremated and have my ashes scared, uh, scattered from a fairy in Puget Sound, something along those lines. Give them direction, let them override it if you think that you might want them to do that. But there's a lot of pressure when people die to kind of keep cremated remains unless there's direction otherwise. So I usually encourage people to kind of work through that exercise and then give people the chance to override it if they don't want. And this is something that a lot of people do consider prepaying for because Tiffany is going to go into a little bit of the probate process. But basically, when someone dies, we eventually have to go to court to get somebody appointed to administer the estate. And by the time that all happens, most likely somebody has already wanted to, you know, take care of disposing of the remains. So generally your estate's going to pay for that. They can reimburse someone for paying for this. But to the extent it is prepaid, it is helpful for the people you leave behind to just be able to contact the place that it's been prepaid at and execute on those directives. Next slide. So again, this is a document that's going to be to be signed and dated in the presence of a witness. And that witness has to be there with you when you sign the document. Back to you, Tiffany. There we go. Just one note before um, we move forward to the will section is um, thinking about the position of agent for finances and agent for healthcare um, under powers of attorney, the position, as we mentioned, you know, that can involve end of life decisions. It can also involve a little bit of a longer time commitment on behalf of the agent, so to speak. So, for example, um, if you have someone, you know, if you're, you appoint someone and then you have kind of a longer term illness, you're not necessarily terminally ill or in a position of making end of life decisions for, you know, terminating um, life support or things like that, but you need some extra help. That could go on for, you know, any number of years sometimes where your agent is helping both with finances, also with, you know, making medical appointments, um, ensuring that you have transportation to those medical appointments, kind of managing um, your healthcare in the way that you would during life, similarly managing your finances that you um, that you would do on your own if you had the capacity. And I said, I, I misspoke with regard to the um, agent for healthcare, managing your healthcare as you would have when you had capacity, not during life. Both of these occurred during life. Um, so anyhow, thinking about that person, not only from the perspective of being able to make those kind of end of life decisions, but also the, the time commitment that could occur before death that might um, come up. We just don't know. And so thinking about who makes sense in those roles is very important. With that, I'm going to transition into talking about what happens after we breathe our last breath. So at that point, that is where the durable power of attorney for finances and healthcare is no longer valid. It's no longer effective, rather. Um, you know, the person is deceased. And so what happens then? Well, then we're looking at, you know, what is effective? Transitioning from life to death, transitioning from agent for finances, agent under, you know, for healthcare into the world of, okay, now what we're doing is looking at the overall um, assets of the individual, creditors of the individual. From like a business perspective, thinking about kind of that final tax return, that final wrap up of our kind of financial lives, so to speak. And one of the roadmaps that we use very frequently is a will. And I would say probably nine times out of 10 for Washingtonians, this is going to be um, the tool that makes the most sense. Um, we'll talk about the revocable living trust here in a few minutes and when that can work for folks, because um, that's sort of a will substitute. You typically have one or the other as kind of the, the roadmap, so to speak. But for the most part, um, folks of really any shape and size in terms of their estate are very well served utilizing a will. And what that does is it appoints someone um, as executor or personal representative to gather all of the decedent's assets. Um, make sure that, like I say, make sure that any outstanding creditors are paid, and then ultimately distribute those assets, what remains, 
um, according to the wishes that are expressed under the terms of the will. It is very much a roadmap. It gets filed with the court after death. And so a lot of times um, folks will have their attorney keep their originals because we have will vaults <laughs> and safe places to store those. And you don't actually need the original will until the person has died. And so what happens then is the will gets filed with the court and that happens regardless of whether or not a probate is required. Um, we file the will with the court and then the personal representative or executor, depending on what the assets are and what the circumstances are, um, will likely open a probate, be formally appointed um, as the executor or personal representative pursuant to the terms of the will. So what's required um, for a will to be validly executed. It needs to be in writing. It needs to be signed by the testator. So if I'm the person making the will for myself, I'm you know making the will of Tiffany R. Gordon, I'm the testator. So it needs to be signed by me and it needs to be witnessed by two or more competent witnesses in my presence. And so what we, um, much like Liberty mentioned with the healthcare directive, what we recommend for clients if they're going to sign in our office, this doesn't come up because it's one of the staff people that is signing as a competent witness. And we're all competent witnesses in the office. Um, but if you're signing outside of, you know, your attorney's office or otherwise, making sure that, again, the person is over 18 and don't have a family member, somebody who's going to possibly be named as the executor or, or going to receive something under the will, um, serve as one of those witnesses. It's best to have completely disinterested um, third parties serve in that role as witness. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because you've heard me say probate a couple of times now. And we want to talk about what that is because under the terms of a will, um, or, or if you use a will rather as your primary estate planning tool, oftentimes there is a requirement that your estate is probated that there's a probate that's open, an executor, a personal representative is appointed. That's part of the probate process. So what is a probate? And I think that this is worth discussing because it has a bad rep. Um, <laughs> it's not a dirty word, folks. In some states like California, for example, it is. It is Probate is not desirable in that state. <laughs> it is expensive there. It is a very time consuming process, but that's due to the design of kind of the way that their laws work and the way that their court system works. Um, there's a percentage that's charged for a probate fee that is paid to the attorney and it's kind of a clogged system. So moving through the court um, process there can be a pain in the head, a pain in the neck. That's different in Washington. In Washington, it's not that big of a deal to go through the probate process. That's why I say nine times out of 10, utilizing a simple will as a Washingtonian, even though the estate is gonna need to go through probate, it's gonna have to be administered, um, doesn't cause trouble or issue or shouldn't cause you any consternation. Because what probate really is, is a court supervised process of settling the deceased person's estate. So basically, like I said, we're gonna gather all of the assets, we're gonna give notice to creditors, make sure that creditors are paid if they're if they're legitimate creditors, um, and then ultimately transfer the remaining assets to the folks that are listed in the will as beneficiaries or to trusts or wherever things are going under the roadmap. That's really what the probate process is. And what you do is you file the will with the court as the executor or the personal representative, you file the will with the court, and then you say, hey court, Tiffany has died, I need to be appointed as her personal representative or executor pursuant to the terms of the will. And then the court signs an order appointing that person as the executor and giving them the authority to act under the terms of the will to go out and contact financial institutions if they have a house to you know engage a real estate agent um, to list and sell the house, to clean out the house, to take out, you know, deal with all the tangible personal property. Basically, that person has the ability to kind of go through all of the decedent person's belongings and then make sure that things are liquidated appropriately and then ultimately distributed to the named beneficiaries. So if a decedent dies with a will, then chances are the estate's going to be probated. Similarly, if the decedent dies without a will, um, which we're going to talk about here a little bit more in a minute, um, 
then they are considered to have died intestate. And we have certain statutes in Washington that govern who receives things under those circumstances. But similar to dying with a will, the court process of probate um, is, is very similar. And what it is, is it's, it's an administrative process. And I think that it's worth clarifying. Um, here's just a list of kind of some of the things that we've talked about what the, what the executor does. Um, it's worth clarifying that if you avoid the probate process by using a trust, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, there's still going to be administration. So you're kind of choosing in Washington, at least six of one half dozen of the other. Do you want to have a probate administration and the state administration or do you want to have a trust administration? Because either way, when the person dies, either the trustee in a trust scenario or the executor or personal representative in the will probate scenario is going to come in, gather the assets, notify the creditors, file any final income tax returns for the decedent. If there's an estate tax return required, which we'll talk about here in a minute, they'll make sure that that is filed. Um, any taxes are paid, and then ultimately distribute the assets according to the terms of the will, similarly um, with, the, with the terms of a trust and a trust scenario. So we talked about what probate is. What are non-probate assets? Because the will is going to govern only probate assets. So non-probate assets are easier to identify <laughs> Probate assets are governed by the will. Non-probate assets have their own kind of titling associated with them. So assets that are titled as joint tenancy with right of survivorship, um, property that's held in a trust, life insurance policies when we have a designated beneficiary, um, if your bank account is a transfer on death or pay on death account, um, or property that's subject to a community property agreement between spouses. Those are assets that have some other type of direction attached to them that for for that individual asset rather than you know an account um, that doesn't have a beneficiary designation <clears throat> that would be considered a probate asset similarly real estate it there's is going to be considered a probate asset <clears throat> so the will is going to govern anything that's kind of not listed here so anything that doesn't have its own titling or beneficiary designation that involves the asset flowing directly to another individual or organization, that's going to be a non-probate asset. So the will is going to govern everything other than the non-probate assets. So one of the things on that list of non-probate assets are assets held in trust. That is kind of the key to avoiding probate um, with a revocable living trust or an RLT as we call it, you know, in the in the legal community. This is a document that, remember, this is like a will substitute. So it's not something that is going to save you estate taxes. It's not something that's going to save you from third-party creditors. It is simply a document that, rather than being effective at, kind of at death or active at death, rather, like a will, it's active during your lifetime. And it's going to govern distribution of your assets at death in the same way that a will does. But what is different is with a revocable trust, for example, in my own life, if I set up the Tiffany Gorton RLT, I'm going to change the title on my house. I'm going to change the title on various financial accounts into, rather than just being in the name of Tiffany Gorton, in the name of the Tiffany R. Gorton Revocable Living Trust, the Tiffany Gorton RLT. So basically, I title all my assets under the terms of the trust. The trust essentially holds my assets during life. I would serve as my own trustee. I could still sell my house. I could still have a mortgage. I still file my income taxes the same way. I still use my bank account the same way. I'm still writing checks, doing all those things. There's just a titling difference in terms of utilizing a trust like this versus a will. And again, this is not the type of trust that you're giving your assets away during your life for tax purposes or funding this for somebody else during your life. This is a trust that is simply a tool that avoids probate, and it's a tool that is a will substitute. So you either use a will or a revocable trust as kind of your primary roadmap um, for assets passing at death. And it is not something that is designed particularly for um, tax savings or otherwise. There are a lot of types of trusts out there that do that, but this is not one of them. 
So what about RLT administration? Like I talked about with probate and administration under a will. In this scenario, we have a different roadmap. We have the RLT as the roadmap and we have a successor trustee. So I'm my trustee during my own lifetime. And then I'm rather than appointing an executor or personal representative, I appoint a successor trustee when I die that successor trustee is automatically has the authority under my trust to come in, gather my assets, um, things that are named that are titled in the name of the trust during life. They'll give notice to my creditors. They'll file my income tax return. They'll make sure that an estate tax return is filed if that's required. And then they'll ultimately make distributions under the roadmap of the RLT. So you see that the, um, the kind of legwork, the administration post-death, is very similar between a probate and a trust administration. And with that, I think Liberty is gonna hop in and talk about what happens if you don't have an estate plan. Yes, before I transition into that, I think there's a couple of questions that I wanna make sure that we get through because kind of okay. the foundation of this presentation was selecting a fiduciary for people, that was kind of the core. So there's a few questions mm -hmm. that I'm going to throw out there and we'll get to those and then we'll move on um, after that. Sounds so great. First, how do you find a professional fiduciary, Tiffany? Oh, that's a great question. My clients ask me that very frequently. So you could do a Google search. Um, you could reach out to your attorney and say, hey, do you know any professional fiduciaries? There are a number of them in our area. Um, so most big banks have a trust department. If that's something that serves your circumstances, by all means, that is certainly a place to look. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, any bank that has a trust department has these types of folks um, staffed for this type of purpose to serve as a you know successor trustee or otherwise. There are also um, smaller shops in our area that there's a company called We Trust. Um, there's private client fiduciaries. There are tons of them where there's there's a whole team of folks that serve as a professional fiduciary agent for finances. They'll serve as executor. They'll serve as trustee. Um, and so basically just, I think, looking looking online is a great starting point of, you know, professional fiduciaries in the, in the Seattle, Puget Sound, King County area. Um, you'll come up with a huge list of them. And there are also some individuals um, that serve in that capacity that, you know, much like a, an attorney can work as a solo practitioner, there are a number of professional fiduciaries that work on their own. Um, Shannon Scott, Scott Trust Services, Weyburn Trust. Um, there are a number of those types of um, sm even smaller shops where it's an individual who is is running it and working in that capacity. And yes, reaching out to attorneys to get their, you know, get kind of a list of some of those places to reach out to. And then from there, you know, a lot of it is just contacting those places and mm -hmm. figuring out what their fees are. Um, attorneys aren't going to know their fees off the top of their head. That is just kind of a, you're going to have to reach out. You're going to have to talk to them. A lot of those places want to get to know you during your lifetime, especially if you're appointing them as an agent, um, you know, in your durable power of attorney, they want to know you, they want to know you in your good condition so that they know what they're doing when they step in when something's gone wrong. So a lot of it is just reaching out and unfortunately, you know, kind of doing that legwork of having conversations with these places, especially if you're not going to select a family member to do this, of, of reaching out and having the chat and getting to know them and seeing do you like these people? Are they responsive? How do they respond to you? Are they asking you kind of what your what your situation and what your decisions are? Of that's a sign of them being you know going to be a good fiduciary in that sense. Um, Tiffany, the next kind of must, most upvoted question is how to verify if a fiduciary is doing a proper job and what can beneficiaries do to dispute actions of fiduciaries? And you are the litigator, so. That <laughs> That is a great question. So that is just by definition, those fiduciaries have to act, they're required to act in the best interest of the principal, in the best interest of the beneficiaries with regard to, you know, beneficiaries under a will or beneficiaries under a trust. And <clears throat> there is, um, there would typically be kind of some check and balance language under the terms of the document. However, even without that, regardless of what the document looks like, 
that fiduciary role is they are acting on behalf of and for the benefit of like i said either <clears throat> the principal in the term in the in the situation of durable power of attorney or the beneficiaries in the in the world of kind of wills or trusts and if they're doing something wrong i mean I do spend a significant amount of my time litigating in the trust and estate world. And so I see some very nefarious characters. Um, but if they're doing something wrong, if they're doing something bad, you have, you know, even if you appoint a family member to serve as your agent or to serve as your, you know, um, personal representative under your will, and they're, you know, helping themselves to assets. I mean, that's pretty egregious behavior, but it happens something like that happens, um, or if there's simply carelessness or otherwise, as a, as, an, as a principal under the durable power of attorney, so for my power of attorney, if I suspect or one of my loved ones suspects that my agent is not acting properly, they have the ability to ask questions and get an accounting. Similarly, if I'm deceased and my beneficiaries don't feel that there is, there, they think that there's an issue with the executor or with the trustee, they have the ability to ask questions, get information. And, you know, kind of the, the last resort, if they're not getting satisfaction, or they've gotten detail that indicates that there's a problem, they can petition the court. And the court is there, you know, <clears throat> it's you don't necessarily want to run to court all the time. But if there's a circumstance that warrants it, um, that fiduciary, again, they're held to a standard um, of making sure that they are acting in the best interest of their charge, so to speak. So if they're doing something wrong, there are ramifications. And, and I think it can be different depending on documents. Sometimes we see really old documents where it was like, there is one bank and it shall be trustee and there's no kind of method to remove them or anything along those lines. And that's where we look at maybe going to court of, we think that you know they're overcharging something along those lines. But then in some documents, I definitely try and make sure if beneficiaries are otherwise responsible, that they might have the power to remove a trustee and replace them. You know, if it is a bank or a professional, that they can remove them and replace them with another professional that they would like to work with. So it really just kind of depends on the language and the documents of do we need to go all the way to court or does something in the actual trust or document allow us to kind of, you know, pick somebody else to serve in that role. So it really just kind of depends on the document itself. Um, okay, we're going to go on to what happens if you don't have a plan. So we've talked about the importance of having an estate plan so far and kind of the different documents that should be included with it. And some people, you know, might think, you know, I don't have a ton of assets or, you know, I just want it to, you know, it'll go to my family and that will be fine. But what some people don't realize is that by not creating a plan, you're essentially letting Washington create a plan for you. So if you die without a will, or if something happens to you during life where you can't make decisions for yourself, basically the state of Washington is going to kind of step in and say who can manage things for you. So if you're alive but unable to manage things, unfortunately, that process can be pretty intensive. If you don't have a durable power of attorney that says, if I can't manage things, Tiffany steps in to manage them for me. If I don't have that in place, essentially, we're looking at going to somebody going to court on your behalf and taking away your rights, either with a guardianship, which is managing kind of your personal decisions, or with a conservatorship of managing your financial decisions. And that's a, that's a you know, time consuming and expensive process that could potentially be avoided with a properly drafted power of attorney. And if you die without a will, you are considered to have died intestate and Washington law is going to determine who manages your estate and where it goes. Next slide. So if you do not have a will, Basically, somebody is going to go and petition the court to say, you know, this person died, they didn't have a will, and we need to serve as executor or personal representative. And the order for that is going to be, if this is a single person, then it is going to be that person's child or children will be first in line. If they petition, the court is most likely going to, if there's no other reason not to, appoint them as the representative. If there are no children, then we're going to continue looking at your family to see if somebody should serve. So it would be parents and then siblings and then grandchildren. 
And then nieces and nephews are going to be kind of who we're looking at. And if none of these people are willing to serve, we kind of keep looking at the family tree and it could eventually end up being that a creditor steps into this role to get a state open so that they can get paid. Next slide. And then as far as administration of your state, so somebody gets appointed to be the personal representative, the executor. If you don't have a will and you die in test state, then your estate is going to be distributed to your family. Basically, Washington is going to keep looking at your family tree to see if we can find someone. So if spouse, then spouse. If kids, then kids. And then we kind of go into, if we can't find anyone there, we're looking at parents. And then we're looking at siblings and then nieces and nephews. And if we can't find anyone there, we're going back up the family tree to see are there grandparents or aunts and uncles and cousins and going down there to eventually find someone to inherit. So to the extent that you wouldn't want that to happen, or you would want to create trusts for some of these people or skip some people or give to charity, like, you know, the library, things along those lines, that's where it's really important to actually create these documents and state what you do want. So you aren't forced with the plan upon you by Washington state. Next slide. Or actually, we're really close to being out of time here. Do we want to do a couple of questions before we talk taxes? Um, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Okay. And and we can give you a few more minutes. Um, I think if you want to go right up to until one, we'll I think we're good. Okay. Um, let's just start. Let's start with questions, Tiffany. Are you okay with I that? I think that sounds great. Yeah. Okay, so the first one that's kind of been upvoted the most is how does a fiduciary receive notice of a client's death? So this is one of those things where it really kind of depends on who you're appointing in these roles and how they would actually know if someone died. So this is again where it's important to let people or organizations know if you're appointing them in these roles. And if they are not family or friends who have regular contact with you, kind of establishing that regular contact. Otherwise, it's important for those places to know where your um, documents were. Like, are they stored at a law firm? Where are they at? And, and realistically, it's kind of creating that system for yourself of methods of communication with them. Unfortunately, sometimes if things are on auto pay and things are going smoothly, sometimes we don't know that somebody has died, especially if they die of natural causes at home, if they're not in regular communication with people. So at least kind of establishing that system for yourself, if it isn't family or friends who are constantly, you know, in contact with you of having regular check-ins with the, the company that you're naming as the fiduciary. Anything on that, Tiffany? No, I think that that's a great point. Okay. Um, if you are writing this yourself, how do you go about getting it documented legally if you don't have a lawyer? Unfortunately, I don't know any lawyers who are going to review a document that you have drafted yourself. There's honestly too much liability for attorneys to take that on to kind of approve a legal Zoom document or something along those lines. For the most part, attorneys are going to want you to work with them. There are plenty of attorneys out there who will do, you know, if we're talking minimal assets, things along those lines, some people do flat fees, some people do hourly rates. But unfortunately, if you want an attorney involved, they're generally not going to review a document that they haven't drafted to kind of bless that. And that's an issue that comes up sometimes um, where I'll have folks that either have done, have worked on something on their own, or they have something that their prior attorney worked on. And then they'll come to me saying, Hey, I just, you know, want to make sure that everything's covered here. And part of the issue is, is, as Liberty mentioned, you know, there's a significant amount of liability there, but also it is, it's more cost effective and efficient for us. We, we work with our own documents. We're constantly updating those. We're very familiar with them word for word. We've written them. <laughs> we're the authors. And so rather than kind of trying to tick and tie from a document that is completely foreign to us versus understanding what your intentions are and then making it so utilizing our documents it can you would end up with a larger legal bill in most circumstances trying to kind of 
do a, a patchwork, so to speak. Um, but one thing to think about is, you know, there are, um, my late law partner, Tim Burkhart used to say, you know, I want to, I could wire my own house, but I want to live there. And so I make that joke. And, and I do say that, you know, you do not necessarily have to hire counsel to draft any of these documents. There are resources online. Um, and, you know, part of the reason of building in, you know, what's required for a power of attorney that, you know, it's signed, it's dated, it's witnessed or notarized, what's required for a will, it's, you know, it's signed, it's witnessed, et cetera. Um, I would say if you're going to do that on your own, making sure that you've at least um, kind of hit those things is is kind of a starting point. And I think there was a couple questions earlier that I answered just typing in answers while Tiffany was talking of what happens if you did estate planning documents in Washington, but you're moving somewhere else, or you've recently moved to Washington from somewhere else. And we're not going to get into kind of the tax part of this, but estate planning is so state specific. And as long as you execute documents validly in one state, they're going to be respected in another state. But we will always recommend that when somebody moves to a different state, that you reach out to an attorney in that that new in that new state to see if it works with that local jurisdiction. And so, um, you know, whether it's somebody reviewing the documents, which you're paying for their time to review, or whether you're just updating for the new state, is really going to kind of depend on what your comfort level is there. But it is important to update estate plans for different states to make sure you're fully taking advantage of the law and understanding. Some states have income taxes. Some states have estate taxes, they're very different. And just understanding what's happening in that new state is important. So it is it is something that it can travel, but you still should talk to a new attorney in that one, in whatever state you're in. And with that, I see Jessica um, on the screen. And so thank you to everybody for being here. Um, if we didn't get to your question, um, feel free to, you know, continue to submit those. Um, Jessica and Kara, oftentimes we'll, we'll shoot those over um, and if you want to reach out via email or otherwise, you know, by all means, happy to happy to answer some of those questions um, and and kind of <laughs> get 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 them all answered for you, so to speak. But thanks again for having us, and thanks to Seattle Public Library Foundation and King County Library for for having us. We really appreciate it, the opportunity. Thank you, thank you um, to Tiffany and Liberty. Before um, you all um, leave the the room, let me just make um, a few very quick announcements. Um, a true thank you to Tiffany and Liberty who have done an incredible job. As you all know, there's always more questions than can be answered today. In our emails that we do send along, um, you will also continue. You will get the slides. You'll get the video, of the presentation uh, link, and we do include um, contact information so that you can keep the conversation going. Um, my name is Jessica Carso, and I'm the Director of Donor Relations at the King County Library System Foundation. And I want to thank you all as well for joining us today. And just a reminder that when you exit the webinar, there's going to be a very, very brief, but really, really important survey. I really appreciate Tiffany sharing at the uh, start of this how important those surveys are because they have really um, helped shape what we're doing in the future. And we are already planning for 2024. So Take, your t take the time to um, share with us because we are in the midst of planning. Um, and if you do uh, take the survey, you are entered into a drawing uh, to win that bag of books, which I always think is quite a, a prize. Um, again, just said it, uh, but want to say it one more time. Uh, it is really important. We have comments in the chats. We have questions that um, we know want to be answered. So look out for the emails that will come by the end of this week. Um, it will also have uh, Kara's information, my information, so that you can get in touch with us as well. Um, if you, you will also see on the screen, as soon as we depart, you'll have our contact information there. So feel free to get in touch with us. Last but not least, please know that we are getting all into the season of giving. Um, and that kicks off um, during Giving Tuesday, which is the Global Day of Giving. And it happens the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. So as you're thinking about supporting nonprofits that you love, uh, we hope that you'll remember your libraries in your um, personal giving as well. Thank you all very, very much for coming today. Thank you again, Tiffany and Liberty. This is incredible information that you share with us and you're very generous with your time and we truly do appreciate it. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody.